In this video, we'll be going through the solution for the 2023 IGCSE Computer Science Specimen Paper 1A. Let's get started. Question 1. A school network has several computers. Each computer in the network has a media access control address. Hex decimal is used for MAC addresses. Part of a MAC address is given. Each pair of digits is stored as binary in an 8-bit register. Question A says, complete the binary register for these two pairs of digits. This question is asking us to convert hexadecimal numbers into binary numbers. Each hexadecimal digit can be represented using four binary bits, so two hexadecimal digits together will give us eight binary bits. Let's start with the first calculation, 97. To convert hexadecimal into binary, we'll go digit by digit. Let's start by writing down the first hexadecimal digit, which is 9, and using the 8421 method. To make the number 9, we need to add 8 and 1. So cross out the other two digits and underline 8 and 1. Then to get the binary number, under each number we've underlined, write a 1. And each number we've crossed out, write a 0. The second half of the hexadecimal number is 7, so let's do that. Again, we'll do the 8421 method. To make 7, we need to add 4, 2 and 1. So we'll cross out 8 and underline 4, 2 and 1. Then do the same thing as before, writing 0 underneath the crossed out numbers and one underneath the underlined numbers. We now have the two parts to the binary number, so let's copy it into the blocks. Let's do the next number, which is 5c. We'll start with the first digit, which is 5, again doing the 8421 method. This time, 5 can be made by adding 4 and 1. So under the cancelled numbers, write a 0, and under the underlined numbers, write a 1. Next, we'll work out c. c is not a denary number, so we need to convert it to a denary number first. Starting from the beginning, we know that A is equivalent to 10. Then, counting up, we can say that B is equivalent to 11, and C is equivalent to 12. So, we'll say C is equivalent to 12. Let's now use the 8421 method, and 12 can be made by adding 8 and 4. So, the answer will be 1, 1, 0, 0. Let's write the two parts into our answer, and that is question A complete. Question B says, describe what is meant by a MAC address. This question is for 4 marks, meaning we need to give 4 points as to what a MAC address is. First, we can say a MAC address is a unique address used to identify a device. We can then say it is assigned by the device manufacturer and does not change. Let's count the marks for this answer. First off, saying it is a unique address is 1 mark. Saying it is used to identify a device is another mark. Saying it is assigned by the device manufacturer is 1 more mark, and the last mark comes from saying it does not change. This would give us four marks. Question C says, give two other uses of hexadecimal in computer science. There are a number of answers we can give. The first answer being color codes. Hexadecimal can be used in the 24-bit RGB color system to represent different colors. The next answer we could write is Unicode. For example, the UTF-16 encoding for the lowercase a character is U plus 0061. Other answers that would be accepted would be memory addresses, memory dumps, or in IPv6 addresses. Let's move on with the next question. Question D says another value is stored as binary in a register. A logical left shift of two places is performed on the binary value. Complete the binary register to show its contents after this logical left shift. When performing a logical shift, we need two bits of information. First is the direction of the logical shift. Next is the number of places. We can get both of these from the question. The direction is left, and the number of places is 2. To perform the shift, we'll start on the left-hand side, then count two places to the right. Draw a line where you stopped, then cancel out the numbers that you skipped over. For every number you cancelled out, add zeros to the end. We now have the new binary number, which we can copy down into the answer. The next question says, state one effect this logical shift has on the binary value. After doing the logical shift, there is no way of getting back the previous values, so these values are lost, meaning the number becomes incorrect. So we can say that the value becomes incorrect as the left two bits are lost. Question E says negative denary numbers can also be represented as binary using two's complements. Complete the binary register for the denary value in negative 54. You must show all your working. To solve this question, we're first going to convert positive 54 into binary. We can do this using the division by 2 method, where we start with the original number, 
and divide it by 2. We write down the answer, then write the remainder of the division. Then we copy the results and repeat the same process. Again, dividing this number by 2 and taking the remainder. Let's repeat again. This time the answer is 6 with a remainder of 1. We'll keep repeating until we get a result of 0. In this case, the answer is 3 with a remainder of 0. 3 divided by 2 gives us 1, remainder 1. And finally, 1 divided by 2 gives us an answer of 0 with a remainder of 1. The binary number will then be the remainders, reading from bottom to top. So first copy the 1, then this 1, then the 0, then the 1, 1, and 0. Notice in the register, they give us 8 bits to fill in the answer. This means we need to make an 8-bit number from this 6-bit number. The way that we can do this is by adding two zeros to the beginning. This doesn't change the number. This now represents positive 54, so we need to convert it into a negative number. To convert this positive binary number into negative, we'll follow the method of flipping the bits, then adding 1. To flip the bits of this binary number, for every 0, we'll write a 1, and for every 1, we'll write a 0. So the new number will become 11001001. The second step is to add 1 to this new binary number. This is now doing simple binary addition. So adding 1 to 1 gives us a 0 with a carry of 1. The next bit, adding 1 and 0, gives us 1. Then we can copy the rest of the binary number down. And this gives us the correct binary number. Let's now copy it into the register. That completes this question, let's go on to the next one. Question 2 says a company has a website that is stored on a web server. Question A says the website data is broken down into packets to be transmitted to a user. Describe the structure of a data packet. A data packet can be split up into three sections. The header, the payload, and the trailer. The header contains many bits of information, but the three most important bits are the destination address, the packet number, and the originator's address. Let's go ahead and write an answer for four marks that includes all of this information. First, we can say that a packet has a header, which contains the destination address, the packet number, and the originator's address. We can then say the packet also has a payload and a trailer. Question B says the website hosts videos that users can stream. The company uploads new videos to the website. The videos are compressed before they are uploaded to the website. Tick one box to show which statement is a benefit of compressing the videos. Let's go through each of these options to see which is a benefit of compressing a video. Starting with question A, when compressing a video, we do not encrypt the video, since there are no encryption methods involved in compression. For option B, the duration of each video will be reduced is not a valid benefit, since compression does not reduce the length of a video. Option D is also invalid since compressing a video would lead to less bandwidth being required. This means that option C is the correct option, since a compressed video will take up less storage space on the web server. The next question says, give two methods of compression that could be used to compress the videos. There are two main compression methods that we know for IGCSE. Those are lossy and lossless compression. Lossy compresses a video by permanently deleting unnecessary bits, whilst a video compressed using lossless, can be returned to its original version. Let's move on to the next question. The company uses parallel half-duplex data transmission to transmit the data for the new videos to the web server. Explain why parallel half-duplex data transmission is the most appropriate method. Let's break down what this type of data transmission is. Starting with parallel. Parallel data transmission is where the server and client are connected using multiple wires or multiple pathways. Then multiple bits can be sent at the same time from the server to the clients. This means that large amounts of data can be transferred between the server and the clients. And since we are transferring videos, this is useful since videos usually have a larger file size. Next, with half duplex data transmission, this allows two way communication between the server and the client, meaning that the client can download videos and upload videos. But transmission can only happen one way at a time. So while bits are being sent from the server to the client, the client cannot send bits back to the server. And the same goes the other way. Let's now write the answer for four marks. First, we can say that parallel allows the fastest transmission of large amounts of video data. 
we can then say that data can be uploaded and downloaded, but not at the same time, due to half duplex. Let's count the marks for this question. First, saying that parallel allows the fastest transmission gives us a mark. Then saying that we're using large amounts of video data related to the question, which gives us a mark. Then we can say that data being uploaded and downloaded gives us a mark, but not at the same time, again, relating it to half duplex gives us another mark. This would give us four marks total. Question C says the company is concerned about a distributed denial of service attack. Describe what is meant by a DDoS attack. A DDoS attack is where multiple computers are used as bots, and each computer sends a large number of requests to the server or the router. The server is unable to respond to all the requests, and any non-malicious connections will fail to be processed by the server. This means that the server will time out and will not be able to access the internet. Let's go ahead and write this answer for four marks. First, we can say that a large number of computers send requests to a server at the same time. The server is unable to respond to the requests and times out. Any regular requests will not be processed and users will lose access to the internet. Let's count the marks for this answer. First, we said that a large number of computers send requests. This would give us one mark. Next, we said at the same time, this gives us another mark. The server is unable to respond to the requests, gives us one more mark, and the server timing out gives us another mark. Any regular requests will not be processed, and users losing access to the internet gives us one more mark, which is more than the necessary four marks. The next question says, suggest one security device that can be used to help prevent a DDoS attack. A firewall is one security device that can be used to help prevent a DDoS attack. You could also say a proxy server for this answer. Let's move on with the next question. Question three says a web server has an internet protocol or IP address. Give three characteristics of an IP address. For IG, we need to know two different types of IP addresses, IPv4 and IPv6. An IPv4 address could look something like this, where we have four groups of digits and each group can be a digit between zero and 255. An IPv6 address on the other hand could look something like this, where we have eight groups of digits and each group consists of four hexadecimal numbers. IPv4 is a 32-bit address, meaning there are two to the power of 32 unique addresses. With IPv6, we have 128 bits, meaning we have two to the power of 128 possible unique addresses. Let's look at some general commonalities between IPv4 and IPv6. First, we can say that they can be statically assigned or dynamically assigned. When the router assigns an IP address to your device, it will either be static or dynamic. A static address does not change, whereas a dynamic address may be changed by the router. IP addresses can also be public or private. Public IP addresses are accessible to anyone on the internet. So, for example, your router can connect to the internet using its public IP address, whereas it will assign private IP addresses to devices within the home network. These private IP addresses are only accessible within the home network, meaning the only way to access the computer would be to go through the router. Let's go ahead and write down a few of these points in our answer. First, we can say that IP addresses can be IPv4. We can also say that they can be IPv6. Finally, we can say that they can be public or private. But you can mention any of these characteristics that we've spoken about. The next question says, identify the network component that uses the IP address to send data only to its correct destination. In this case, the component is going to be the router. Question B says, the website has a uniform resource locator or URL. An example of a URL is given. Complete the table to identify the name of each section of the URL. The URL can be broken down into many different parts. The first portion is always called the protocol. So let's write that in our answer and defines what type of connection will be made. The next part is what we call the domain name, and defines the name of the resource or website we want to visit. The last part is called the web page or the file name, and defines the specific path or name of the file that we want to access from the website. Let's move on to the next question. Question four says a computer has a von Neumann architecture. Circle three components that are part of the central processing unit in this computer. The CPU is made up of multiple different components. First, we have the main components. These are the ALU, or the Arithmetic Logic Unit, and the Control Unit. We don't have any of these in the options, so let's keep going. The next category is the Registers. These are the Accumulator, Program Counter, 
memory address register, memory data register, current instruction register, index register, and so on. In the options, we have the accumulator, so let's circle that. We also have the memory address register, and we also have the program counter. The other components we have in the CPU are the cache, buses, and the clock. Question B says, describe the purpose of a control unit within this computer. The control unit is one of the main components within the CPU, and its primary function is to send control signals that manage the transfer of data and instructions within the CPU. So we can say the control unit sends control signals to components to manage the transfer of data and instructions. The control unit also decodes instructions using a specified instruction set, but since this question is only for two marks, we'll leave that out. Question C says the computer has a single core CPU. State one purpose of a core in a CPU. A core in a CPU is what we refer to as a collection of all the components. Modern CPUs have many cores, such that they can process many instructions very quickly. The main purpose of the core is to carry out the fetch-execute cycle in order to process an instruction. So we can say to carry out the fetch-decode-execute cycle and process an instruction. The next question says the computer is upgraded to a dual-core CPU. Explain how the upgrade can affect the performance of the computer. A single-core CPU only has a single set of components, meaning it can only process one instruction at a time. A dual-core CPU has two sets of components, meaning it can now process multiple instructions at the same time. This, in turn, would increase the performance. Note that it's important to say that you are increasing the performance with this answer, since the question asks how the upgrade can affect the performance. If you simply said it can process two instructions at the same time, you would only get one mark. Question D says the computer uses a bootstrap. Tick one box to show the parts of a computer of which the bootstrap is an example. The process of bootstrapping is to load a set of instructions that will then in turn load the operating system into the RAM. This usually occurs when we start the computer. For this reason, bootstrap is an example of firmware. Let's move on to the next question. Question 5 says a program that uses a high-level language to create a computer program. Identify two advantages to the programmer of using a high-level language instead of a low-level language. Let's compare high-level and low-level languages. First, we can say that a high-level language is human-friendly, meaning that it is easier and quicker to read or understand high-level language. The low-level language uses more code lines than high-level to do the same task. The reason is that it is directly manipulating memory and hardware within the computer to execute the task. Next, we can say that a high-level language is portable. This means that it can be run on any machine. Low-level language, on the other hand, is dependent on the specific machine we're writing the program on. This is because individual CPUs have different requirements and different instruction sets. So the way the program interacts with data and the hardware will be different across different machines. The last thing we can say about high-level languages is that it requires a translator to execute. This means the high-level program must be converted into a low-level program for it to be able to run, and the translator usually handles that. Then, with low-level languages, we can say that in general, they have a faster execution than high-level languages, since they don't require a translator. Let's use these comparison points in the answer. In this case, we're looking for two advantages of using a high-level language instead of using a low-level. First, we can say that high-level languages are easier to read or understand. Then, we can say that the code is portable. The next question says suggest one disadvantage to the programmer of using a high-level language instead of a low-level language. Since low-level programs generally execute faster, we can say that the program may be less efficient. Question B says the programmer uses an integrated development environment when creating the computer program. State what is meant by an IDE. The IDE is software that developers use when creating computer programs. The software allows you to write code, execute the code, debug the code, and provides useful features such as pretty printing, syntax highlighting, and breakpoints. So we can say that it is software that provides programmers functionality to write computer programs. Let's go to the next question. Question 6 says robots are used in a factory to build cars. One characteristic of a robot is its mechanical structure. State two other characteristics of a robot. The main purpose of robots is to do manual labor either as efficiently or more efficiently than a human. This means it must have mechanical parts. It must also be programmable. This means a human operator would be able to tell the robot what to do. The robot would require electricity to run, so we can say it has electrical components. 
Question B says, suggest two advantages of using robots instead of humans to build cars in the factory. To answer this question, we need to relate it back to the original question, which is that robots are used in the factory to build cars. So our answer should take into account that the robots are building cars. We mentioned in the previous answer that the main function of robots is to be more efficient than humans. So let's write that down as the first advantage. Cars are fairly heavy objects and it would require multiple humans to be able to move the components of a car around. Instead, it is more cost efficient to replace the humans with a robot, which is able to lift larger and heavier equipment than its human counterparts. So we can say they can lift heavier equipment than humans. Let's go on to the next question. Question seven says the Unicode character set is used to represent text that is typed into a computer. Describe what is meant by a character set. A character set is a collection of all characters and symbols that can be represented by a computer system. Each character or symbol will have a unique value assigned to it. This value is usually in hexadecimal, denary, or binary. In this case, we're showing the denary number for the characters A, B, C, and D. So we can write, it is a collection of characters and symbols that can be represented by a computer system. Each character or symbol is assigned a unique value. Question B says one disadvantage of using the Unicode character set instead of the ASCII character set is that the text stored takes up more storage space. Give one reason why it takes up more storage space. To answer this, let's compare the size of ASCII and Unicode. All ASCII characters can be represented using 7-bit binary, whereas Unicode can usually be represented using 8 or 16 binary bits. The reason that Unicode is larger than ASCII is because Unicode has a large collection of symbols and characters compared to ASCII. So for the answer, we can simply say each Unicode character is encoded using more bits than an ASCII character. Let's go to the next question. Question eight says, draw a diagram to represent how virtual memory is created and used. Virtual memory is needed when the RAM becomes 100% full and more memory is needed to keep the computer running. A portion of the hard drive is used as virtual memory which the RAM will transfer pages between in order to virtually increase the size of the RAM. Given this information, we can draw a diagram to represent this process. First, we'll draw the RAM, then we can draw the hard drive. Next, we can show a portion of the hard drive is being assigned to virtual memory. Finally, we can show how the transfer of pages is occurring between the RAM and the virtual memory. Question B says a student is using software to create 3D models. This process often requires the use of virtual memory. Explain why virtual memory is needed for this process. We said before that virtual memory is required when the RAM is at 100%. This can occur in two ways. First, if many programs are currently running, they would have lots of data that is stored in RAM, which may cause the RAM to reach 100%. Alternatively, a single program using a large amount of data could also cause the RAM to reach 100%. In this case, we're using software to create 3D models. 3D models take up lots of storage space. And if you're currently working on a 3D model, all the data needs to be loaded into the RAM at the same time. So in this case, it is most likely the second scenario that is occurring. So if the RAM becomes 100% full, we would need virtual memory to prevent the computer from crashing. Let's go ahead and write that for our answer. So for the answer, we can say to increase the RAM capacity and prevent the 3D modeling software from crashing when the RAM is full. It also allows the computer to process the large amount of 3D modeling data. Let's move on to the next question. Question nine says complete the sentences about symmetric encryption. Use the terms from the list. Some of the terms in the list will not be used. You should only use a term once. The easiest way to solve this type of question is by deductive reasoning. So if you don't know what the answer is for each blank space, try and read the sentence with each word and see if it fits. The process of symmetric encryption is as follows. We start with plain text. This gets encrypted into ciphertext. Then it can be decrypted back into plain text. The defining trait of symmetric encryption is that it uses the same secret key for encryption and decryption. Knowing this information, let's go ahead and answer the question. The data before encryption is known as plain text to scramble the data and encryption algorithm, which is a type of key is used. The data after encryption is known as ciphertext. Encryption prevents the data from being understood by a hacker. That is this question complete. Let's go on to the next question. Question 10 says an art gallery uses a secure socket layer to provide a secure connection when selling art on its website. Describe the process of SSL and explain how it provides a secure connection. 
There are two steps to this question. The first is to describe the process of SSL. The second step is to explain how it provides a secure connection. Let's do the first step, which is to describe the process of SSL. First, we start with the buyer or the client and the art gallery or the server. First, the buyer will connect to the gallery and request its digital certificates. The gallery will send its digital certificates over to the buyer. The buyer will then authenticate the certificate, making sure it is valid. Once the certificate has been authenticated, the transaction can begin. Let's write this process down. First, we'll say the buyer will first send a request to the gallery. The gallery sends a digital certificate. The buyer authenticates the certificate, which contains the gallery's public key. If successful authentication, the transaction will begin. Next, we can explain how it provides a secure connection. Any data that now gets sent between the buyer and the gallery will be encrypted. So let's write that down. We can also say that this uses asymmetric encryption. That completes this question, which completes the paper. If you enjoyed this video, take a look at the solution walkthrough I've done for the specimen paper 2 and programming problem. Otherwise, enjoy the rest of your day.